Okay, the agenda for today will be starting off with the case study, the Hector Gro case study. As you already know, it's kind of a follow-up case. We did the Hectomol to begin with. And in the Hectomol case, you're really looking at the uh, potential or the prospect of launching this brand Hector Gro. And the reason why it fits very well in terms of towards the end of our session, in terms of our end of our uh, course, is also because uh, this is the kind of situation you're often going to be grappling with in real life. So you're launching new products, you're kind of relaunching products, you're constantly looking at what to do next with my brand. And this is the ideal case for that kind of a situation. Let me go straight to the um, first aspect about this case, which is communication. Okay, and in particular, I wanted to know, ask you actually this question, how effective was Hector Gros advertising and communication strategy? What do you think? Question one, yeah? Oh, um, I think that they did pretty well in terms of like the like the share of voice. It was like uh twenty eight percent, so it's quite high compared to like the market leaders. Yeah. And like I think the first moment of truth is a trial. So the there was actually like the data that showed that the the build up of the trial users was higher than the benchmark of the category. So I think that in terms of it reaching out to consumers, I think it was above average. And whether that message got through, right? So there was another exhibit that showed, um, they asked whether it was better suited for growing children. And over 50% of the respondents agreed that it was better suited for growing children. So it meant that, you know, Hector Grow actually hammered in that message uh, to the consumer. So they're clearly seeing it's a kind of growing up milk. That people are talking it's better suited for growing children. And there are a few other things they're talking about. It looks more healthier now. And as you very rightly pointed out, uh, people are trying the product, which means it is uh, the, the advertisement is creating an immediate impact in the terms of creativity, for sure. But also, is it relevant to them? And uh, is it credible? And so forth. So those kind of things, novelty, re relevance, and credibility getting through. In terms of uh, whether it's registering in people's minds, were there a couple of metrics that were uh, there in the case study? In terms of whether it's registering or not in the people's minds? Yes? So I uh, two metrics to look at, top of mind awareness and spontaneous awareness. So Hector Grow achieved 16% top of mind um, right. advertising awareness and 30% spontaneous. So, yeah. And why does that look good? Because relatively, uh, they're better than their competitors. Perfect. So you want to look at it in comparison, a uh, sense of a comparison, right? So I think you've really got this answers kind of really chalked out. Anybody wants to add to what, what was said? Okay. Yeah. I think maybe it's so because it's in relative to the competitors and it's a new launch, new brand launch. And it's already comparing to like top, top competitors like Gain and Tumac who already have like high continuous awareness. And then I think also another point was that um, uh, for the brand registration part, there was also a bit of confusion. There was a bit of 32. They actually registered 32 percent of them were actually quite confused for what it stands for. So I think there's lack of differentiation between the mother brand and actual group. Good points. Okay, so a couple of things out there. I think very importantly, you compared it with some of the brand leaders, and it's not an apple to apple comparison, right? And, and that's why when we're doing so well compared to brands which have been around for a large number of years, if this uh, brand, uh, the, this new brand is comparable or doing better than many of these other brands, then that's really good. They've done very well in terms of registering. The advertisement awareness is there and then the brand awareness. So two things are registered very clearly here, okay? What about the next thing we want to look at? Okay, we looked at communication, first part. What about the market potential, okay? So one of the things we want to look at is, how successful is the brand in attracting consumers? That is the trial rate. Okay. How effective is the brand in generating a base of regular consumers, which is where the RBR comes in? But the RBR is a function of two things. Okay. We are also looking at it in the context of loyalty. So both of these factors are captured in this context. You're looking at a base of regular consumers and also how much are they consuming at the same time. And uh, the market potential, as you pointed out, is uh, is the TRB model and basically looking at all of these as well as the buying index. So we're looking at trial, a proportion. So for a brand to succeed, 
it has to have a substantial or a reasonably large number of people who try the brand, okay, number one. Secondly, it has to have a fairly large number of those trialists to continue buying it so that it falls within their repertoire and they continue to do so. Okay, so those two are the base of regular shoppers is what they need. If people just buy a product once, twice, and maybe five or 10 times and they never buy it after that, then that product won't last, of course. So having a base of regular shoppers is crucial. And uh, we already addressed this in the context of the fact that we are looking at the TRB model. Now, uh, as Valerie mentioned, one of the things which we notice in terms of the trial, it's higher than the benchmark. Okay, so that's a very positive indicator. So we have a benchmark for this industry, and therefore we say the first moment of truth exceeds benchmark. Okay, so that's good. What about the RBR? Does that look good or bad? Any, uh, any context on that? Uh, Prof, I want to ask for the trial rate, right? How do you estimate, like, what's the uh, value that you're going to plug it into the model? Ah, good point. Okay, so firstly, I, I guess you, you recall what this exactly is. It's cumulative, which I think you totally understand. Because okay, so you're looking at the trial cumulative. Now, there are various models that you can use. In a very simple sense, you can even plug it into Excel, okay, and look at the closest fit and a forecast, and Excel can actually give you that. But there are some more sophisticated models. You might assume that it's exponentially declining or exponentially kind of arriving at a particular level. So there's an exponential kind of a rate. So there's a marginal, so there are various models you could use, okay? So in terms of predicting where it might level off. So if you, if you knew the uh, trial rate is gonna be 20% in a medium term uh, kind of a projection, and if you know that the RBR is gonna be uh, around 33% or so, 20%, 33%. How do you, what is your estimate of market share? What three metrics are we looking at? We're looking at, you already know that somebody mentioned that earlier. What are the three metrics we're looking at in forecasting market share? First? Trial. Trial, Trial. okay, you all know it, right? Second? <laughs> RBR, okay, third? Buying index. So we got 20% multiplied by 33%, multiplied by 1.05, and what do we get? Okay, so so we're really looking at second moment, just to mention that this is the second moment of truth, okay? Um, and, uh, and this would be, uh, let me, since we just talked about the TRB model, 20%, 33% into 105, which gives us a share prediction of 7%. Quite good, okay? Because it's better than the way, where we're ending off in the year itself. Year three share is uh, 6.1, and we're saying the projected share could be 7%. Fundamentally, what, it, what the data is telling us is we've got strong RBR, okay, which suggests high level of adoption. We've got strong, uh, uh, we've got better than uh, benchmark in terms of the trial rate, which means first moment of truth, the trial is good, adoption is good. So we are. We have a good feeling about this brand. That's what I want to say here. Okay, and it's always good to see a brand which is doing well. This one is doing well. Okay, so now we come to the second part of our uh, session where we're really trying to understand what do we want to do next? What are our goals and what are our objectives? How can we grow beyond 7%? So well, how do we further grow the brand, enhance its equity? So that's the key next phase. And I wanted to uh, touch upon uh, this. If you're really looking at making it grow further, making it more successful, then what are the fundamental goals for any brand of that nature if you, in the context of growth? What fundamentally should we be looking at? So we're trying to, we're looking at goal setting now. Very important when you are in a real life situation, you want to set goals first thing, and then there are a couple of other things after that. So the first goal would be to try to get more consumers to, uh, we'll set that goal, we just now, we're just looking at what the uh, uh, direction should be. Get consumers who are trying, who try to continue buying. So we, if you're getting people who are buying, who trial lists, we want to make sure that they stay with us. So it falls into their repertoire, they become repeat buyers. And lastly, the third important thing is get them to buy more, because usually in FMCG, you have a repertoire of purchases, so you want to make sure that your brand loyalty continues to increase. So these are the three fundamental things we need to do to go to the next phase of development. And that has to be translated into very specific goals. 
In real life, that's going to be, I mean, if you do it in this particular fashion, you are likely to succeed. So we're going to say, okay, trial was 20%, RBR was 33%. I set two goals. One is trial 30% and RBR 35%. Why have I stretched ourselves a lot more in terms of trial and a bit less in terms of RBR? Which one is easier to kind of grow? Trial. Trial, trial right? That's the easy answer. And how can, what are the ways you can increase trial? What are the, what are the ways you can actually induce trial? Uh, small pack size. You could have small pack sizes. And what else? Uh, give with purchases. Kind of like incentivize people to buy that product. Gifts, okay. I'm thinking of new flavors because during the chat it says that the issue was children didn't like the flavor and there was limited choice of flavor. So having new flavor also induced trial through sampling. So this could be in-store sampling near the booth itself to actually convert like competitors, buyers to actually try our product. Very good. So getting new flavors, people who may not be liking the existing flavor, you still want to keep the core malt in within because that's the identification, but you might reduce it and kind of add more flavor to it. So there could be those kind of things you could do. So we're talking about one thing we could do is we could kind of tweak or change or drastically or substantially enhance the product itself. Obviously, one of the most important recommendations will be on the product I mentioned. Okay, what else? Yes? I suggested to improve their advertising messages because um, moms purchase the product based on they need to be convinced on the value of the product, not so much on the child's preference. So I said that they should clearly communicate their values to because it's currently perceived as expensive and there are cheaper alternatives. So I okay. think they need to communicate the value that they are not like the regular products. There's a point of differentiation and the value is worth it to pay the money. Very good. So you also want to kind of reinforce the message and, and kind of channel it and target it really very specifically in terms of the advertisement so that, and also there was a certain amount of lack of clarity. One reason why they might not perceive the value is because Hector Malt was a different product and Hector Grow is a very distinctly different uh, product with a much more stronger proposition and, uh, and a totally different price point, of course. Anything else? Okay. Um, I think what Maxo did seven shows that Hector Growth is rather price sensitive. Like if you give a promotion to it, I'll give it like price off and then like the demand, the sales will spike up. So in this sense, like if you really want to um, increase demand and on the marketing mix of promotion, then price off will be one way. But you also want to keep in mind not to give too much price off and it can't be like for a super long period because in this category, mums are particular. They see it as if it's higher prices, they associate it with better quality. Okay, those are very good points. Um, one of the things you really need to distinguish between is discount price elasticity and regular price elasticity. So the example which Ying Tong mentioned was basically discount price elasticity. This is like saying, okay, Hector Grow for this one week is going to be 15% off or 20% off, and you see a huge gain in sales which is very different from the regular price elasticity, which is also what Ying Tong mentioned. We have to be careful about the fact that, you know, moms perceive price as a kind of a gauge in terms of quality itself. So in the context of price, um, you don't want to play around with it too much. You might have already got that right because you probably benchmarked it against competition, but you want to promote because when you promote it and you give it off, then you get a huge surge or increase in sales. So particularly when you got something new coming into the marketplace, you want to promote it so that you induce trial, you get people to try the product. And also promotions leads to uh, regular buying or you know, it also helps in terms of RBR. There's something else very important in the context of a product. What is the other big opportunity in the context of a product? And it comes basically from a threat also. What's the characteristics, quote, one of the fundamental characteristics of the growing up milk market? A high churn rate. There's a high churn rate, very good. So what that really means is I can do all this marketing effort and get these new consumers in but I'm losing 50% of them every year. How can I retain them? Like you go into older age range gum, so maybe like a, like a stage four kind of gum market, target like kids who are aged like maybe seven years old and above? Yes, precisely that. 
Actually, stage four would be three years to six years. Okay, what about packing, packaging, what size? What is ideal? So we have uh, three pack sizes, 200 grams, 700 grams, 400 grams. Would you want to launch something new? You might want to look at their um, buying behavior as, as such. So we had this data there. We've got a lot of sales information. Purchase volume per trip. Does that suggest something? Purchase volume per trip. On an average trip, how much are they buying? More than a kg, right? Do we have a pack size which is more than a kg? No, so that's an opportunity, right? So you can look at it from that context. Now that my brand is successful, when you launch a new product, the smaller packs are really important. And once it becomes more established, then you want to look at, you still want the 400 gram pack and maybe even the 200 gram pack for the newer variants that come in. But for the more established products and the variants, you might want to focus more on the bigger packs. Okay, so that's what the uh, kind of information I was thinking would be in terms of rationalizing of the pack sizes. You might even go as far as sachets for two reasons. One is particularly to induce trial. Okay, sachets you can give for free. So you're buying trial, you know the RBR is re reasonably good. So if people try my brand, and I know that they, many of them seem to like it after, after they try it and they continue buying it. In that context, uh, sachets might help, plus the fact that this is a growing up milk and the, uh, for toddlers, and toddlers are all over the place on playgrounds and here and there and so forth. And uh, there's another opportunity for convenience, context, out of home consumption. What else do we need to do? The last element in this particular case study. We want to set up a target, okay? So now when you're looking at setting targets, we've got to look at trial, RBR, and market share once again. We are looking at a trial rate of 20%. Our goal is 30%, so maybe we could set that as a target, or we could tone it down a bit, okay? So we are really looking at these numbers now. So what I've looked at in terms of target is 25%. We've looked at this as 33%. The goal here was 30%. I've toned it down, I'll come back to you on that one. And then we say we'll probably get a projected share of nine to 11%, but we're setting a target of eight to 9%, and we might even look at brand equity and say, can we look at a target here from 0 0.6 to 1.0, particularly with all of these initiatives and the fact that over time it's gonna get stronger and healthier. Okay, couple of questions. Why did I tone this down a bit? Because a target is a commitment. That's a very important thing to always remember. When you set a target, it's a commitment. So there are two things. It should inspire and motivate, but make sure it's realistic and achievable and keep a buffer. Because once you make a commitment in real life, you're expected to achieve it. So a, a nice target which stretches you a bit, okay, is really good. And when you overachieve it, you become a hero or a heroine. Okay. But on the other end, if you really set up a target which is very bullish, and even though you did a fantastic job but you missed your target by a bit, you don't look good. And plus, the, those commitments, they go from country level, brand, you know, uh, brand level, to category level, to country level, to regional level, to global level. So all of those targets are really then stakeholders and everything else. It goes much beyond just marketing. It's financial people, the people who are buying equity and so on. All of that, so the organization is never wanting to overcommit, and you also have to be careful because your bonus will depend on whether you achieve your target or not. The other reason why, even after this, I'm getting projected share of nine and 11, this is after maybe 18 to months. At my year is gonna be year four. I'm starting at 6.1% market share. So if the, at the end of the year, if I achieve eight or nine, that is good enough. I'm not gonna be achieving nine or 11% simply because that is a projection which is beyond a year sometimes, okay? So bearing all of that in mind, those are some of the important messages that I have. Um, and that is basically the case. Any questions on that? Okay, you know, we had a lot of questions and we had a lot of dialogue there, which is great. Um, so we're done with this particular case study. Um, I think I'll move along.